can shape events in their city. But more often than not, it's events in our city that shape us. There are precedents and protocols sitting in the reserves of institutions just like this one that will give you about a thousand reasons not to do something, not to speak out, not to act so quickly. And I've wrestled with more than anything else over the last 36 hours one fundamental question. Why is the man who killed George Floyd not in jail? If you had done it, or I had done it, we would be behind bars right now. And I cannot come up with a good answer to that question. And so I'm calling on Hennepin County Attorney Mike Freeman to act on the evidence before him. I'm calling on him to charge the arresting officer in this case. We cannot turn a blind eye. It is on us as leaders to see this for what it is and call it what it is. George Floyd deserves justice. His family deserves justice. The black community deserves justice. And our city deserves justice. I'll, ask, I'll stand for any questions. What about the other officers? One. I'm sorry, say it one more time. You said um, the, uh, the officers killed him. What about the other three? The evidence that I have before me right now, which I hesitate to speak on in depth, uh, given the fact that I ultimately want a charging decision to move forward, is somewhat limited to the video evidence that is there. And I do not want to get into the, the fundamentals of different classifications of murder. I do not want to get into the fundamentals of, of, a ch of any one specific charge for any one individual. What I can say with certainty, based on what I saw, uh, is that the individual, uh, the officer, who had his knee on the neck of, of George Floyd should be charged. And I'm calling on Hennepin County Attorney to do that. Do you want to wait this in there? Can we just pause for one second? Is the audio okay on the live stream? Okay, go ahead. All right, sorry. Do you want to wait? I mean, do you need to see the, the cause of death? We don't, we, we don't have a public cause of death at this point. He died an hour after the incident. You need, obviously, by saying what you are, you don't need to wait. But uh, could, you, could you explain why that's not important? And, Making a criminal charging decision. I'm not going to weigh, weigh in on the evidence. Uh, I know there's clearly more evidence to come, uh, but I will say that, that based on what I saw in the video, this is the decision that I am making. Uh, obviously, as not a prosecutor myself. Have you talked to Mike Freeman? Is, is he open to this idea? I have relayed. Uh, I relayed my call to action to the Hennepin County Attorney, Mike Freeman, yes. What do you want to see this officer charged with, specifically? You know, I, I want to see a charge take place. I want to see justice uh, for George Floyd and me commenting on either uh, the evidence, obviously much of which is not out yet, and or a specific charge would inhibit that measure. Um, so again, I want to see the charge of the arresting officer take place. Uh, but if we want to see that charge, it would not be wise for me to provide the specifics of a form of murder. And Mayor, would you just repeat the question? Yes, I will. My apologies. Uh, Mayor, multiple council members have raised questions about the way police reacted to the protests last night. Where were you during those protests, and what role did you play in determining how police responded to them? Thank you for the question. Uh, the question from Liz was, uh, what role did I play in, in responding to the protests that were occurring last night? Um, and I, I'd like to speak a little more broadly about this as well. Uh, so right now, more than ever, I get the need to protest. I fully understand and appreciate it. People need a way to vent, especially in a time of so much sorrow and anger. And I'm not a parent yet. Uh, but I will be soon. And I can't begin 
to grasp the mix of emotions, of, of anger, of sadness that so many black, parents of black children have through our city and what they must feel in putting their child to bed. without knowing what cards they will be dealt and not knowing how their safety might be put at risk. And nobody out there will fight harder for the First Amendment protections and freedom of speech than I will. Nobody will fight harder for those rights to protest than I will. But those rights, they must stop when others' public safety are put at risk. Uh, the cars, and the buildings uh, that were broken or broken into in some form had live guns and ammo in them. And I spoke with our Chief Arredondo uh, last night, who is an exceptional leader in our black community and known as an exceptional chief nationwide. And he told me that he could not run the risk of one tragedy leading to another. Our chief made the decision and I support our chief. I trust his judgment. And there's, there's an inherent tension, there's an inherent problem in this world of, of sound bites where those who are protesting peacefully get lumped in with those that are not. Where those who are policing compassionately get lumped in with those who are not. And by the way, I want to commend the 99% of protesters that were there last night doing so in a peaceful manner. And we need to be straightforward. We need to be straightforward and honest with people 100% of the time. We need to be continue. We need to continue to be calling on our on our better angels, especially during this time where where one crisis is sandwiched in on another. I'm committed to doing that. Next question. No mayor has ever publicly called on a prosecutor to bring criminal charges against a police officer, at least here in Minneapolis. What went through your mind? What uh, went into this decision to come up here and do what you're doing today? The question was that. He stated that no mayor has ever publicly called for the prosecution of one of his or her own officers before, uh, at least in, I think he said, in our state. In Minneapolis, at least, as far as I know. Uh, and the question is, what went into that decision? Right. Now, I mentioned earlier that there are protocols, there is, is guidance, there's precedent. Uh, that is almost instilled in the walls of these institutions like city government as if it were mortar. And so many of those protocols say that you shouldn't act quick. You shouldn't make a decisive decision. You shouldn't speak out. And they'll give you a thousand reasons why that guidance is given. But there was one question in my mind that I could not answer. If I'm tasked with being honest with people, which I do promise to be, how could I argue, how could I not speak out when an offense took place that you or I or many other people through our city would have been behind bars if they did? Yet this particular individual, this officer, was not. I could not answer that question, and because of that, I felt I had to speak out. And by the way, black men have been put in prison before for far, far less. One of the early police uh, uh, reports from the scene described uh, um, some fighting, uh, you know, that he uh, resisted arrest. Have you seen any evidence that that has 
they have both been borne out. Obviously, the you know we've seen the videos from surveillance cameras. And, um, uh, um, Daniela Frazier, Darnella Frazier. But we we haven't seen anything that would suggest any resistance. Have you seen any at all in any of the evidence you have seen? The question is whether I have seen evidence that. Uh, George Floyd resisted arrest in some form. Uh, I, I have not seen any evidence to, to show that, no. I, I have not seen any evidence beyond what you've seen. And the, one, uh, the other question is a $20 counterfeit bill, I've been told by sources, wouldn't even get you booked into jail right now because of COVID-19. Can you explain the heavy presence at that specific grocery store at that specific time, why they felt that, why police felt so compelled to, to keep that quote unquote suspect there? The, the question was, uh, it, it is, and I'll try to repeat what you said, it, it seems that uh, a counterfeit bill would not require such heavy police presence, uh, and why was there he such heavy police presence there at the time? And uh, no, I, I, I do not know. I cannot speak to that. When can, when can we expect to see the body camera footage? I'd like to release it as, as soon as is possible while not compromising uh, the, the, in, the investigation, but more importantly, the charge uh, that I do hope will come forward. Who makes that decision? Is that up to uh, Chief Rondo or BCA? The investigation itself is in the hands of the BCA right now, um, and actually there are other investigative bodies as well, uh, the FBI being one of them. Um, we're, we're looking at the legal logistics of how exactly that would work. Um, but again, uh, we want to be as transparent as possible. Um, there's every reason to provide the public with the truth. Uh, there's also every reason to make sure that this investigation takes place in a way where we can get to a charging decision as soon as possible. Uh, the question was, uh, so I'm calling on local authorities to uh, make a decision and to come forward with a, a charge of the arresting officer. The question is whether I'm asking federal authorities to do the same. Um, my understanding is that the, the charging decision lies with the Hennepin County attorney. To the extent that uh, I'm wrong, and there is a charging decision that also lies with other bodies of government. Yeah, I'm calling on that too. Surely you must have a preference back to the, the body cam footage. I mean, are, you talk, are we talking one week? Are we talking 48 hours, two weeks? I mean, I know you don't want to compromise the investigation, but surely you're under pressure and you must have a preference about that. It's a, it is a fair question. The, the question was, what are we talking about in time? Are we talking about three days, two weeks? Um, Rochelle, to the extent I, I could give you an answer on that, I, I would. I, I, I do not know. I would like to see that footage released as soon as possible. Um, you know, if, if we could do so in a way uh, where we could in, in ensure that investigation was not compromised, a charging decision was moved, was moved forward with in the very near future, you know, yeah, I'd, I'd do it right away. So the question was, um, let me withstand with, with with scrutiny of, of, of who? Of, and biased and in making a decision about whether a Minneapolis police officer should be prosecuted criminally. So the question was whether we can be confident that the Hennepin County attorney can uh, not have a bias in making a decision um, about this particular case. You know, I, I think we've seen a, a very long history uh, in this country of charging decisions being made that did not do justice uh, to the victims, especially when the potential charging decision was against a law enforcement individual, and even more so when that law enforcement uh, officer was, was white and the victim was, was black. Um, you know, I've stated what I want to see. Uh, I am very hopeful that the, the evidence will be 
reviewed and there, that a charging decision will not just be made, but there is a decision specifically, there is a decision to charge. Um, I'm not going to uh, comment further than that. Mayor, do you know if it, do you know if any of the four officers gave statements before they were fired, internal statements at the very least, before they were fired yesterday? I do not. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how you made your decision that, that this man could be charged? I mean, was there something, is it something that's in the public domain that you saw? Is it something that everyone's no. seen, or do you have pretty more information than we have? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you straight up. So the question was, um, can I elaborate a little bit more on my belief? that the arresting officer should be charged, and yes. We watched for five whole excruciating minutes as a white officer firmly pressed his knee into the neck of an unarmed, handcuffed black man. I saw no threat. I saw nothing that would signal that this kind of force was necessary. By the way, there, <laughs> that particular technique that was used is not authorized by the MPD. It is not something that officers are trained in on uh, and should not be used, period. And so, in so many of these horrible instances in which uh, law enforcement tragically kills uh, a member of our community, we are talking about split-second decisions. In so many of these instances, we are talking about four or five or six seconds, sometimes less where a decision was made that tragically killed somebody and, and impacted a whole community. We are not talking about a split-second decision that was made incorrectly. There's somewhere around 300 seconds in those five minutes, every one of which the officer could have turned back, every second of which he could have removed his knee from George Floyd's neck, every one of which he could have listened to community around him clearly saying that he needed to stop, every one of which you heard George Floyd himself articulating the pain he was feeling, an inability to breathe. I can't see coming to a different answer there. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to say that. Thank you. Real quickly, have you seen the body camera footage yourself? No, I have not yet. Have you spoken to any of the officers who responded? No. When did you find out the circumstances were different than that initial news release? That was Minneapolis Mayor.